As we're preparing for Christmas, I, I need to confess that this is hard. And we're going to look at a text this year. We're going to look at the beginning of the Gospel of John. And if you know the beginning of the Gospel of John, it really is a message about the coming of Jesus. But if you look closely at it, you'll remember there's no shepherd, there's no magi, there's no nativity, there's no Mary and Joseph riding on a donkey. By the way, a trivia question. Do Mary and Joseph ride a donkey to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. There's all kinds of things we've added to the story to try to, well, and, 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 it, and it may have happened, right? Uh, but the fact is, there's a, a lot of things that we've kind of added to it, and it's kind of picturesque and special and all. But here's one of the dangers. One of the, the, the gravest things that we can do at Christmas time is to have Jesus in the manger. You say, what, Bill? I mean, I mean, come on, nativity, crash, all those things, Jesus, manger, you know, you know, becoming, you know, unreligious on us? No, no. The danger is to leave him a baby. Yes, he came as a baby. But that was not his birthday, folks. That was when he became incarnated. That's when he became human form. That's when God moved into this little infant's body, when he placed himself in limited cells, when God, the creator of the universe, became human. He wasn't born, folks. I know we say that, and I know the, the Bible even says that, but really, Jesus wasn't born then, was he? In fact, from John 1, what we're going to see is that Jesus, the Son of God, the living Word of God, has always existed. He didn't start in the cradle. Because if he does, if he begins there, he's not God, is he? He's a human, merely. And so the mistake is also to keep him that little baby because, you see, as that little baby, oh, he's cute. He's cuddly. You know, we like the story of the angels and the lights and all the pretty things and all. But this is the Son of God who is going to die on a cross. Who's going to rise from the dead in order to give life. But who one day will come back on a horse, a great horse, to lead the armies of heaven into a battlefield that will end all evil. And with it, this world as we know it will come to an end and God will start a new heaven and a new earth. Now here's what I'm apologizing for is this is so incredible. This is so deep. This is so great. This is so unimaginable. So unfathomable that it's above and beyond us. And so in these weeks, as we try to prepare for Christmas, we are challenged with trying to think in terms of the infinite. I mean, just imagine space for a moment, can you? <coughs> imagine it going on and not just... Pla go, go out. Just imagine yourself, you're on a spaceship, okay? And we're going to fa travel faster than the speed of light. So boom, we just saw the moon, now we're leaving the solar system and we're going out into the universe and we're seeing other solar systems and we're seeing other galaxies and we're seeing all kinds of other things. And guess what? You haven't come to the end of anything. There's more to go. It's infinite. It's nonstop. <coughs> now pause for a moment. I don't care where you're at in your spaceship, but pause, okay? <laughs> just hover a little while and look around you. And if you don't feel small in this universe that's been bursting all around you, and then now stop and say, realize that God created this. That it's God's handiwork put these things together and, and formed this. And that, that the, the, if that's not beyond comprehension, so I apologize. 
Because I want us to try to get a hold of something that is so much greater than us. Bigger than we can comprehend. And frankly, bigger than this past can probably explain to you. But I hope you will begin praying today that God will prepare you to understand Christmas in a new way. To understand the richness, the depth, the incredible, awesome blessing that God limited himself into a human body. Now that, that alone is amazing. So let's prepare for Christmas. Let's get the decorations ready. But let's open our heart to what Jesus wants to do inside of us. The Nicene Creed is a creed that was written clear back in 381 A.D. It's a creed that churches have followed now for centuries. Listen to it. It says, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Now listen to this next phrase. Eternally begotten of the Father. How long has Jesus been around? Not since the year just zero. Not just since Bethlehem. But eternally. God from God. He's always been God. Light from light. True God from true God. Begotten, not made of one, but one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's right now, folks. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. It's at the core of all the creeds. You study them. Go, go back and just Google Christian creeds, okay? And there are a number of different ones of them. But look at where Jesus stands out in every single one of them. Jesus exists from the beginning of time and before. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. <laughs> Now think about that. Did you hear where I began? That's from John 1, by the way. And those are the three verses we're looking at just this morning. In the beginning was the Word. But what does that remind you of as well? It's a phrase that would have struck a note immediately with any Jewish listener. In the beginning. And what they would have said next was, In the beginning, God. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God called the light day. Oh, excuse me. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. A Jewish ear would listen to this phrase, in the beginning, and they'd immediately say, in the beginning, God. And what does John do? He says, in the beginning, the word. 
and he's immediately making this new kind of belief and transfer of knowledge to them when he's saying, it's not just in the beginning God, but in the beginning God, which is the word. But guess what? This is not a new statement for Israel. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Incidentally, have you already not heard the Trinity present? The Spirit of God is the breath of God. The Spirit of God. Did you notice in Genesis 1 when I was reading those first few verses? Where was the Spirit? Hovering over the waters. What? Blowing over the waters? <laughs> Spirit of God's there. God the Father, the Creator is there. But also, how does creation come into existence? Through the spoken word of God. Here you hear it again. By the word of the Lord, Psalm 33, 6, the heavens were made, their starry host, what? <sighs> By the breath of his mouth. Psalm 29, 3 and 4, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. There's a very important word <laughs> that we're going to use throughout the, verse, the first 18 verses. What is that word? Word. <laughs> It's the, it's the key word in this whole introduction to John's gospel. And don't forget, John is sharing his gospel. He says that they will know Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, and believe in him. He actually declares, this is the purpose of my writing all this. And he's writing this especially to us, to Greek ears, who are going to hear things just slightly differently. He's writing this message to us so, so we will come to know Jesus Christ. He's, and notice, John was with Jesus for how long? At least three years, probably three and a half years. Seen all the miracles. Experienced all the blessings. He was there, called to be one of those disciples to come follow him and make fishers of men. He was there when Jesus walked on the water. He was there when Jesus fed the 5,000, and then when he fed the 4,000. He was there when Jesus made lame people walk and blind people to see. He was there when he lifted little children from the dead. He was there when he saw him personally rise from the dead. John was there for all these experiences. And what is Jesus, John going to try to tell us now? He wants us to understand that the Word of God has been existent from the beginning and before time began. Ray Steadman says, what is a word anyway? Well, think about, what is a word? Do we really need words? <laughs> uh, don't forget the Tower of Babel and everyone spoke in a different word and what happened when they couldn't understand words. Talk to somebody who has hard hearing problem like I do at times. And you, you don't hear all the words, so you have to turn the volume up. Steadman says, a word is an audible or a visual expression of a thought. Thoughts are incommunicable until they are put into words. Thoughts are here, but they have to come out in words. Several times the scripture asks, who has known the mind of the Lord? The answer is no one. Nobody knows what God thinks until he tells us. In fact, we might just as well ask, who's known your mind? I know guys and gals are saying, well, none of us understand the other one. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to convey to you today the thoughts that are in my mind and the only medium I have is words. You are listening to what I'm sa trying to say, so you are thinking my thoughts because my words shape and form the meaning of them. That is what John means here. Stedman goes on. In the beginning was the Word. The beginning of what? Well, the beginning of everything. In other words, <laughs> this Word of God was eternal. It always has existed. It was not called Jesus before he came as a man, however. 
The word then was called other names in the Old Testament. You'll find that he is called the angel of the Lord, or sometimes simply the Son. Jesus was the Son of God before he came to earth. And John 1 begins explaining who the word is. <laughs> Alexander McLaren says that the threefold utterance in John 1, 1 carries us into the, to the depths of eternity. You're on your spaceship. <laughs> Before time or creatures were, Genesis and John both start from the beginning. But while Genesis works downwards from that point and tells us what followed, John works upwards and tells us what preceded, if we may use that term in speaking of what lies beyond time. Uh, do I have my picture next, Mike? Yeah. This is a, a great picture that was uh, drawn by um, Elder, Elder Ree, who's a Korean pastor and who decided to do some artwork. And if you look at there, it's, it's Jesus at the Last Supper, isn't it? And he's praying to God, and he's got the cup in his hands. But if you were to look closely at this picture, it is a picture of the words of the New Testament. Painstakingly drawn out, these words lay out there. The New Testament, the message of Jesus Christ. And all those little markings are words. So, by the way, Google it and you'll see the picture. It's a six foot by four foot picture. You imagine him and the hours, I think it was three years it took him to, to draw this all, letter after letter after letter. It's the Word of God. And the Word became flesh and it dwells among us. The Word, folks, was God. <clears throat> I need to be technical with you for a few moments. The words that are used here, the word that is used in, in John 1.1, 1, 1, is used four times, and it's the word was. Wow, we're getting heavy-duty stuff this morning, right? Cool. Most important word is word. The second word that we're going to try to understand is the word was. <laughs> Simple things. That, you know, we totally already know what those things mean, right? Ah, but listen to this. The word here used was, <laughs> boy, if I don't confuse you, God bless you. <laughs> John uses what's called the imperfect tense of the verb a me. And it says that the word a me, God, the word was God. Meaning he was pre-existent. It's in a tense that's been going on non-stop and it never ends. In John 1.14, he uses the verb genomai. That's a part of amy. It's a form of amy. It's now in the aorist tense, egonetto. Now this is an interesting word because when it says that the word became flesh, it what? It's Get, get, get this word. I'm going to finally give you a big word. It's punctiliar. There. There. You thought I was just going to stay with the tough ones like word and was. Now I gave you an easy one. It's, it's punctiliar. means it's an instantaneous intervention. It's a decisive at a moment or point in time. The aorist usage here refers to some historical time in the past as the beginning of a brand new state. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. Point in time, punctiliar. It's taken place. It won't happen again because he already did it. And that's what happened. That's what Christmas is about, that the God becomes flesh, dwells among us. He becomes man. So Jesus, who always was God, becomes man in a moment. Doing so without stopping, without ceasing to be God. This is the amazing truth, folks, we need to try to get a hold of today. That man in him, that, that, that John, excuse me, I'll get there. That Jesus Christ, who is God, became man. He always was 
always is, and always will be God. John Phillips says it this way, the verb John uses takes us into the sphere of the timeless. In other words, the one John calls the word belongs to a realm where time doesn't matter any longer. The word did not have a beginning. The word will never have an ending. The word belongs to eternity. But says John, when we think of Jesus, that is where we must begin. We must go back to the dateless past, to a time before time. We must think of Jesus as never having begun at all. He is eternally God. Whoa, that's big for me, guys. The Fortner says it this way. The word translated was literally means was existing. John is telling us that whenever the beginning was, the word already was. He's declaring that he who is God our Savior is the eternal one. He is that one who was and is and is to come. Whew. Speaking from Revelation 4.8, no created mind can plunge the depths of this vast ocean or traverse its shoreless breath. When time and creatures came into being, the word was. No words could have been chosen by God the Holy Spirit that could more perfectly or more emphatically declare that our Lord Jesus Christ is the absolute, uncreated, eternal God. <clears throat> William Barclay. For a hundred years and more before the coming of Jesus Christ, Hebrew was a forgotten language. The Jews no longer spoke Hebrew. They spoke a version of it. We know that as Aramaic. So therefore, the, the Torah was written and the prophets were all written, what? In Hebrew. When they went to the temple or they went to the synagogue and the scroll was unrolled, it was read in Hebrew. But the people didn't understand it. Can you imagine us getting, having some kind of um, maybe German language Bible and it being read here and then, or like in the Catholic Church it used to be, you'd read everything in Latin. And then you'd try to translate that stuff into English so that people could understand. This is what was happening for the hundred years or so before Jesus came. And so they had, they had writings that they did, translations, if you will, New Living Translations, well, not really, but anyways, they, they had different versions that they would read that were now translated over into the Aramaic so the people could understand them. And here's one of the challenges. The writers who wrote those had the sense that God was so special. You remember that you never spoke the name of God as a Jew. The name of God was too holy. So you used a vow mixture of vows, and you called God Adonai instead of calling him by his name, Jehovah. It was just too, too special. You, 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 we're human. We don't dirty the name of God by speaking it, so we used another name. But when the writers who were writing these translations would come to places where it talked about God or the name of God, they inserted this phrase, the word of God. Now, this is interesting, as it prepares us for the coming of the living Word, Jesus Christ. Because they are already getting a sense of every time, over 300 different times, where these writers are translating the Word, they're putting in this phrase, instead of the name of God, the Word of God. In phrases like this in Exodus chapter 19, 7 and 8. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Going on in verse 17. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. In verses, in phrases like that, instead of it saying to meet with God, it said to meet with the word of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. So they, Moses takes them out to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Okay, I think that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, did you get the picture or did I just go too fast? <laughs> Children of Israel out there waiting to talk to God. Moses has said, and Moses has been up on this mountain several times. He's brought the Ten Commandments down. There's been fire and thunder and lightning and all kinds of stuff. And, and, and they've, he's come down. He's been shining face because he's been in the glory and presence of God. And now he says, hey folks, we're going to meet with the Lord. And they heard it. At least the Jews, the year before, the hundreds of years, hundred years right before Jesus came, they heard it as we're going to meet with the word of the Lord. And now John says, "What, uh, folks? The word of the Lord's here. It's dwelt among us. It's full of power. And the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word is God. And the word he's going to say it in a moment is Jesus Christ. The word, incidentally." that we translate in the New Testament, the Greek word for word, I know, logos, L-O-G-O-S, logos. It's interesting because logos also starts teaching us some things about the coming of the Messiah. Some five, six hundred years before Jesus came, it, Greek thinkers were already thinking in terms of that the, the logos means wisdom, and reason. Wisdom and reason. <clears throat> Did you know that eight times in the opening chapter of Genesis it says, and God said? Do you remember them? God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 3, God said, let there be a firmament between the heavens and the earth, and there was. God said, let the earth bring forth trees and vegetation, and these sprang into being. The Word, the Son of God, was speaking into being what the Father had already designed, and they were coming into reality because the Word, the Logos, the, the Word of God was uh, alive. Proverbs 3 says, blessed are those who find wisdom. Who, who find what? who find Logos. Blessed are those who find wisdom, who find Logos, who find the Word. Now, I, I understand somebody stopping and saying, what, Bill? S Proverbs is written in Hebrew. You're right. But when the Septuagint translates it into Greek, what's the word that's used it? Use, used it. <laughs> that's used here? <laughs> What's the word that's used here? Logos. To translate this word, word. And wisdom. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. Now think about that. If that's not just words written down on a piece of paper, paper. That's not just wisdom and understanding about life, but that's Jesus himself. Think about it. The life that you're given because of the living word. Verses 19 and 20, same chapter of Proverbs 3 says, by wisdom again, by logos, by the word, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. Ah, we are hearing that in John 1, aren't we? By the word, the wisdom of God, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the watery depths were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. Or Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works. Before his deeds of old, I was formed long ages ago. At the very beginning, when the world came to be, when there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. What's he talking about? He's saying the word of God, the wisdom of God existed before all these things were formed. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep. Do you remember the conversation with Job? And God asked Job, were you there? <laughs> were you there when I set the heavens in place? Were you there when I formed the waters and the deep? But the word says it was there. He was there. 
I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out this, the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence. That's the word of God. Folks, this is the statement that may be the most important verse in these first 18 verses. It's the statement that's going to lead the way through the whole rest of the Gospel of John. It's verse 14 of John 1. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We, have we? We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word, the Logos, is alive, is what John's saying. 1 John chapter 1. Okay, that's not gospel of John. 1 John, back near the end of the book, before Revelation. 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. We're talking to you about Jesus is what John's saying. We've seen him, we've touched him, we've walked with him, talked with him, eaten with him, and we're proclaiming now that living word to each of you. First Peter 1, 23, another disciple, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring, what? Word of God, the Logos. Professor John Patterson has put it this way, the spoken word to the Hebrew was fearfully alive. It was a unit of energy charged with power. Therefore, the Hebrew was sparing of words. Did you know the Hebrew language only had about 10,000 words that they used? In comparison to that, the Greeks have 200,000 I'm not sure what modern slang has as its number. A modern to poet tells us how once the doer... No, I'm going to skip that, sorry. When John Knox preached in the days of the Reformation in Scotland, it was said that the voice of that one man put more courage in the hearts of his hearers than 10,000 trumpets braying in their ears. In the middle of World War II, or I should say at the beginning of World War II, because we weren't in it yet, Great Britain was fighting alone. And they were in trouble and they were losing. And the, man, the words of one man inspired a nation to fight on. And Winston Churchill's words were anointed and they made a difference in people's lives. And how many times, and we've watched the movies, Braveheart, or the various generals along the journey, and how they're out there, or the, the coach that's in the locker room, the, the, the captain that's right there in the middle of the huddle, and he's giving this great message, and that's how USC beat UCLA. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Just seeing if you're awake. <laughs> Spoken word is an event in Hebrew. It's why they very seldom would finish a curse. They'd say, God bless you. But even that they were very careful with. In fact, did you know that there was a missionary who actually was in the Islamic world uh, centuries ago and some Muslims came up to him and they said, peace be with you. Later, they found out that, it was, that this man was a Christian. They actually went chasing after him because they wanted him to give the blessing back. Because in the Eastern way of thinking, in the Hebrew way of thinking, a word is an, is an event. So you don't curse. You wouldn't do this. You wouldn't say, I pray that you are all listening, and if you're not, may this roof fall down on top of us. As a Hebrew, you'd say, I pray you're all listening, and may this, and you would not say the rest. Because to say it brought it into reality. A word is an event. And the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And by the spoken word, God creates the heaven and the earth because word is an event. Might want to watch your words. <clears throat> Folks, Jesus is the Word. Yes. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word that's become flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the living Word that's alive with power and authority. Jesus the Word that comes to us and gives us life. 
Greek thought knew all about the Logos. It saw in the Logos the creating and guiding and directing power of God. The power which made the universe and kept it going. Yeah, these are Greek thinkers. Thinking word, key word there. So John came to the Greeks and said, for centuries you have been thinking and writing and dreaming about the Logos. The power which made the world, the power which keeps the order of the world, the power by which men think and reason and know, by the power by which men come into contact with God. And folks, Jesus is that Logos. Jesus is that word that's become flesh. One person said we can put it a different way. The mind of God has become a person. Barclay says when Jesus was among us as a man, he expressed what was going on in the mind of God. He told us the thoughts of God. He was God's utterance on earth unveiling to us what God calls the secret and hidden wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 2.7. What God thinks is reality, that is what ultimately comes into being. God thought about an earth, and it came into being. God thought about a universe, and it sprang into being. God thought about everything we see around us, even we ourselves, and we came into being. So what exists are the thoughts of God. That is ultimate. That is behind everything. Jesus came to unfold that to us and convey it in words that we cannot mistake. So here we are. It's Christmas time. And God's inviting us to prepare for the Word of God, which was and is and always will be. And can we go back to Sinai and see what the children of Israel did when they prepared to meet with God? When they prepared to what? Meet with the word of the Lord. As they got ready, let's go look at them and see what they did. Now I caution you, there might be some challenging pieces to this preparation. And I'm not telling you to do every detail here, but I do want you to get the concept that there's a preparation that we need to be going about as we get ready to celebrate and remember the Word is alive with us. So back to Exodus 19. The children of Israel have been told by Moses, we're going out in three days. You've got three days to get ready for it. We're going out to talk with the Lord. We're going to go meet with the living Word of God. And He has a message. He wants to speak with us. And this is the same God that Moses says, I've been up there on the mountain with and He's been speaking to me. And now He wants to speak to you. And folks, don't come too close to the mountain because you will not survive. We're going to put priests around the bottom of the mountain so nobody can get up there too close. We need to guard ourselves because it's dangerous to go into the presence of God. But the Lord wants to speak to us. And when they get there, there's going to be thunder and lightning and smoke coming from the mountain and God is going to walk speak with his people and what did they do to get ready listen to this in Exodus 19 verse 9 the Lord said to Moses I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and you will always put their and will always put their trust in you then Moses told the Lord what the people had said and the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes. All right, there's first instruction. And be ready for the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Ouch. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. And after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day. And then he makes this 
Weird statement. Abstain even from sexual relations. He says, get ready. Get ready for a meeting with God. And put this relationship and this meeting above all others. Prepare yourself by consecrating yourself. It's not just your clothing, it's your heart you're supposed to be washing. It's getting your heart ready to meet with the Lord and to hear His Word. It's putting Him above all things and all other tasks and all other people. Get ready. Prepare yourself, friends, to meet with the Logos, the living Word of God. I began this message saying, I apologize. You're told as a speaker never to begin that way. But for me, this is so sacred, so incredible, so amazing, so special that I too want to prepare for the living Word of God. Are you ready? If you've never said yes to Jesus Christ, you've never acknowledged that in a public way, you have never really allowed, oh, you've heard it, but you've never let the Word of God come alive in you, then I invite you today to stand right where you're at. If you've never done that, this is your first time ever, and I invite you to stand. I realize maybe everybody here has done that. But this is so precious, so powerful, that I don't want you to miss this moment. If God, the living Word of God, is trying to become real in you, I'm not going to make you talk. Don't worry about that. We're not going to point at you or anything like that. So maybe everybody close your eyes and you bow your head. And if you want to say, it's time for me to live for Jesus, you stand up. Some of you are dying to watch and see who stands. You know what? Die to pray right now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Today, the angels are having a party. Because the Bible says that every time one person repents, one person says yes to Jesus Christ, all of heaven celebrates, and that's happening right now. If you want to prepare for the Word of God this Christmas, you want to get your heart ready, you want to get your focus right, you want to clean things up, you want to concentrate yourself for Him, would you stand? inviting us to a holy meeting. When he first met with Moses, he said, take off your shoes because you're on holy ground, Moses. This is a sacred, sacred place. Why? Because God was there. And God is inviting you this Christmas to meet with him in ways you haven't done in the past. To recognize that he wasn't just a baby, but that he began before time began. And he wants you to have a bigger view of him, to be in all of him, to truly worship him. 
And I pray that God will help you as you commit yourself to allowing him to cleanse you, to consecrate you, to prepare you for that meeting this Christmas season. Would you all please stand? And worship team, please come.